On behalf of AIHS and Art of Work, welcome to today's insightful conversation about COVID-19, emerging from lockdown, applying what we have learned. My name is Mark McLaren, and I'm a member of the Art of Work team. During today's webinar, you'll be able to make comments and ask questions through the YouTube live chat function on your screen. I will hand you over to Kelvin to get the conversation started. Welcome. This is uh, webinar number six in our series on COVID, a partnership between the Australian Institute of Health and Safety and, and Art of Work. Today, we're really privileged to have some of the leading thinkers uh, in, in safety and governance uh, that are working today. Uh, we've got Professor Sidney Decker, who heads up the Safety Science Lab for Griffith University and is the architect of Safety Differently. And uh, Michael Toomer, Managing Partner of Australia for Clyde & Co. And uh, I would say the architect of Law Differently for safety. <laughs> um, and Rosa Carrillo, who has joined us from uh, the US um, and uh, is really the architect of relationship differently. In, and mm. uh, I think uh, what Rosa has done is introduced some really interesting ideas about the importance of relationships in the workplace and the way that we interact uh, with each other. So today is um, a discussion and an exploration uh, of what we have learned coming out of uh, COVID. And I'm, I'm going to now hand you over um, to that discussion and, and seed the discussion with the, the panel members. So firstly, welcome everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Kelvin. One, wonderful to be part of this uh, esteemed panel. And um, I should declare that um, I've already given the instruction that I will change my business cards forever now to be um, uh, architect of law differently. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was, I was. I was also going to mention that um, you're the legal disruptor, Michael. I like that. I didn't want to hand across my title to anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. So, so thanks for joining us. And in setting up the the, the nature of this, this this discussion, clearly. COVID has had an extraordinary effect on everything that we think about in the way that we work, our communities, um, and, and also our consciousness as such. And in that, there's a lot of things that have been done that have um, improved maybe some of the things that we think about and work and interact, and there'll, there'll be things that are creating some conditions or constraints that we need to be wary of. So I'll just hand it across um, to the panel um, to uh, share their thoughts firstly on what has been the most significant uh, interaction or effect um, in your minds that mm. the COVID experiences has had on organisations. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Kelvin. I, I might get the, the conversation started um, and be keen to get the input from um, my esteemed panel members. For me, what COVID has done is it's exposed a number of um, fallacies um, and myths uh, in relation to both how work is done and how work is regulated. Um, and um, there are really five themes that emerge um, from this uh, for me. The first one is that it's amazing how few of the rules that we have in the workplace are actually based on actual laws and obligations. Because if you reflect on it, um, all of us have, for example, working from home rules and uh, things around setup of um, uh, of this space, and um, you know rules in relation to housekeeping and 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 all all of those wonderful things. In some workplaces, how to hold a hot mug um, when you make a cup of tea, um, and it, it, all of us use those those rules to kind of. Um, uh, ridicule some of the bureaucracy that has um, gone on in, in, in safety. But now all of those rules have been removed. All of a sudden, none of them exist. Um, and if one was to do a compliance check uh, against real legal obligations in any jurisdiction around the world, um, I would challenge you to actually find um, where the origin of those uh, rules actually are in, in laws. So it's kind of demystified 
um, some of those myths around, uh, we need to have this safety procedure or this other safety procedure because the law requires it. In actual fact, that's been proven uh, not to be uh, the case. And, and, a, and a related point, I think, um, to that point is how few of those rules are actually necessary. Do I really actually need guidance around um, whether hot water is, in fact, hot? Do I really need um, a, a set of procedure if I decide that after my uh, long, hard day working from home, I'm going to fire up the barbecue um, and, um, and put on a barbecue um, for, uh, for my family? Um, and, and, and building on that, how all of us have managed to survive without that guidance and those rules. In other words, that we're all actually um, smarter than the safety community gives us credit for more. I think more it's confident. more than sur- I think it's more than surviving. <laughs> yeah. I, I actually would claim that we've been thriving with Thri- that. I like, yeah. I like and it. So, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think this is a key point, and I know you've got more more yeah. myths that need to be dismantled, but um, uh, in, in within the misconceptions that have. Mm. Uh, have been laid bare, I think, uh, relentlessly and and mercilessly in in the in the crisis. Um, we have also seen uh, emerge uh, amazing capacities within people to actually do the right thing, um, yeah. to to uh, capitalize on their freedom within the frames that are still there. Right, fifty mm-hmm. kilometers from home, or whatever it is, uh, you can see mom under these conditions, or and so within that. We actually, um, because we're all in it together, because we have a common frame and a common goal and a common enemy, if you want to put it that yeah. way, in a very sort of jingoistic American way, um, we, we, we seem to um, be willing to comply um, without having uh, been compelled in any uh, way by safety people uh, to do so. So the um, people do the right thing. They come up with local solutions that work for them. Um, that lead to safe and even better outcomes. Um, and so I think, but, but I'll just park this on the shelf and then, then you go back to the, uh, the, because I'm eager to hear the no, other, the other no. three, but um, uh, I think what we really need to, need to bottle from this experience, right? Is... I want to add to that because I was on a, on a call with people in the healthcare. Yeah. And I mentioned that, you know, uh, we were talking about drift and I said, everybody has had to drift in order to deal with, yeah, <laughs> crisis because yeah. there was no, there, there was nothing. Yet everybody's still based on the belief that it was the rules that were protecting us. So powerful, so powerful. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. I think I think people. There's a risk here, guys, that people will take the wrong messages out of this, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. That they'll think that actually um, people lecturing us in relation to what needs to happen and uh, telling us uh, that these are. Uh, rules was the the turning point. Actually, to me, the turning point in relation to compliance was people bringing us into their confidence and saying, this is how this virus works. Uh, And these are the reasons why we need the guidance that we have. Um, So please come along on that journey. And whenever Mm. we uh, deviate from that, whenever we start to say, oh, actually, we we, we put out uh, directions that are internally inconsistent or um, we'll get into the minutiae of, you know, only for, only four people in a room and, and one five people at a wedding and, and 10 people at a funeral and, you know, kind of get into that level of prescription. We lose people along the way. Um, I'd be interested in, 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 in your comments around, around, around some of that. But um, I think, uh, Michael, it, it's a, um, a good observation uh, because people have actually been critical of the silliness of some of the rules yeah. in, in that, that space. And, and, and hence you know, really haven't played that, that, that game. Um, and I, I think that's, I think what's really interesting over this process is the way that um, organisations and society has continued to function well, um, mm. given all of the constraints that have been applied upon it. And I think the reason for that, the fact is we are going to the supermarket and there is food on the shelves, there is medicines uh, in, um, mm. in the pharmacies, mm. um, there is trucks delivering all over yeah. the place, there's been yeah. manufacturers are, are, are functioning. I, I'm being really um, amazed about the amount of adaptation that people have been <laughs> amazed, made, uh, are able to do 
in if you look at the the constraints and the rules that were put in place it, it really suggested in the first place there was very little you could do other than sit in your house and that's not what occurred is people have taken that into place and i'm really interested in terms of this adaptive capacity is how have people then and michael i've heard you make this statement a number of times it's been really interesting how businesses have actually yeah. engaged and solve these problems. So I'll put that back to the, the group. And, and if, if, you, if you're trying to tell this story right now, uh, you'll be forgiven for thinking that it's the strict enforcement of rules yeah, yeah, yeah. that, that, that made has it helped so. us, made it yeah. so, right? Yeah. Um, if you actually, when, when time passes and people look back at this period and write history uh, with a bit of research and a bit of, uh, a bit of uh, objectivity, um, what they'll find is, most businesses reacted themselves ahead of regulation yeah. um, and protected their workforces appropriately. Uh, and that is, I mean, I'm sure that is, there are exceptions to, to that. And I'm sure that um, people focus on, on those, those exceptions. But on the whole, um, you, what you would say is that most corporations reacted appropriately and did so by applying what, what has now become the rules. If you can work from home, work from home. Um, if you can't work from home, provide, uh, uh, pr provide certain controls in place uh, to minimise the risk of, um, uh, uh, of um, uh, the spread of, um, of the virus. And businesses, um, for, for the most part, did that without the need of the rules. And in fact, it, one could argue that the rules got in the way because they started to confuse people. Am I supposed to be open? Am I not supposed to be open? Am I, am I um, uh, you know, can I serve um, uh, customers uh, in, a, in a retail setting? Uh, am I not allowed to? Um, should people be congregating outside of my, uh, my store? Uh, you know, when, 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 uh, when the, the, the worst of the economic impact of this occurred and there are large queues outside of um, uh, the, the, the government agencies uh, in charge of... Um, uh, of uh, uh, handing out um, welfare uh, payments. Uh, you know, there was a clear disconnect that people couldn't go to the beach, but they could line up um, in close proximity to each other um, outside the government agency. Ask yourself, what's the logic and science behind that? Um, mm -hmm. For a long time, there was a lot. There was a debate in Australia, uh, Rosa, that you may not have been aware of. But um, you know, schools are safe, uh, but uh, the, you know, the same kids in a park. Um, playing together um, are somehow unsafe, and then there is an internal disconnect and logic and 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 and, and logical, well, illogical um, aspect to those mixed messages. And whether whether that's right or wrong, um, actually, the uh, the intervention of loads of rules, uh, I don't think, helped us in this debate. Uh, it detracted from our ability to to manage the risk uh, ourselves. So the you know, safety definitely uh, leads organisations to engage people as a solution to harness rather than uh, a problem to control. Um, and um, in terms of, um, uh, of engaging in that, um, organisations are encouraged to think about autonomy, mastery and purpose. Yeah. Um, and I think this, this builds upon what Michael has just been saying. Oh, very much so. Well, yeah. the, 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 um, the issue with any crisis is that you can always write the, these two histories, right? I mean, the one history is exactly the one that, that Michael illustrated, that the strength of our ability to deal with the crisis comes from pushing initiative to the points of action, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and allowing it to flourish there and deal with local uh, situations as they emerge and develop uh, and unfold. Um, the other story and history that gets written after crises is a story of strong leadership, right? And, and you see this, uh, in fact, in the last 150 years, those leaders who get elected are the ones who lead a country successfully <laughs> through crisis. Mm -hmm. Those who lose their jobs uh, in, in politics are those who end up being on the receiving end of a recession, right? Mm -hmm. And this is pretty predictable. It's a pretty predictable pattern. Now, um, but I think what Michael beautifully illustrates is that hierarchical top-down control can never keep stable the complexity and the uncertainties of actual work or, or life on the front lines because it becomes internally contradictory mm. before you've even tried, as you illustrated beautifully, right? There is simply 
the, the, the complexity science would explain beautifully and even mathematically why this is so, but I think it's intuitive, right? The sheer volume and the sheer diversity of what happens in the world, in your country, in your park versus school is too much to keep stable in the head. The thing is, it was always so. It was always so. It's not as if this is something, oh my God, this is completely right. new. No, this is what we've been saying all along, right? So exactly. this goes back to Michael's very first point. It's now being laid bare. Right. And it's not unique to COVID. It's not unique to this particular crisis. It was always so. We've always, always deluded ourselves with the with the notion that we can lock uncertainty down, that we can rule uncertainty out, that we can ban uncertainty from the world by writing yet another rule. It's bull. It doesn't work that way. And if we haven't recognized that from the current situation, we need to have more webinars. <laughs> I'll let you to express I don't do it. Me I, I, I this, is, about, this um, is kind of a um, minor example, but when Michael was talking about the rules, I thought um, in one of the things in the healthcare industry that has really uh, been difficult is, get, is to get the staff to wash their hands. There's all these instructions. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 35% compliance rate, you know, by, by those who want to measure it. Yeah. Whatever and now, that means. now here we are washing our hands 20 times a day, you know? Yeah. You have to have a reason, a purpose, a motivation, yeah. uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, you must comply. A hierarchical that. imposition, yeah. 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 Exactly. Beautifully put, beautiful. So well, I couldn't agree more. So yeah. this, this is our opportunity. This it is, is it is. Crisis creates the opening. And I don't know if you're familiar with Naomi Klein. She's an economist. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She wrote the shock doctrine. And she I said, know, I know. Yeah, yeah. When we have that shock, all these possibilities are open. And things that were never possible before suddenly become doable. And we've seen some of those things during the COVID, right? Letting people make their own decisions, be autonomous, be creative, be adaptive, um, work from home. I had a manager who said... I've been having so much trouble with this employee because he's not productive. Oops, he's unproductive. Is that my computer making that noise? Oh, you're fine. Okay. Going. Um, they're not productive and working from home, she's the star employee. Yep, star yep. Employee. So that makes us rethink about the work environment. What is? What are we doing wrong in the work environment that we're actually stifling people from doing their best work? Well, yeah. before we answer that question, though, Rosa, I think, and, and this is where, where I, I want to go back to Michael's three remaining points or whatever they were, but mm -hmm. is, right. I, I don't think, notwithstanding, I think the scholarly, the moral, and the empirical uh, value and superiority of the point you just made, mm -hmm. I don't think we should underestimate for a moment the hysteresis in organizations and cultural systems to deflect back to what. To, to solutions that seemed to have worked for them, which was to write more rules, to lock down uncertainty, to impose constraints from the top down, to organize things hierarchically. This hysteresis will be very strong, notwithstanding what you just said. And I think it would be really useful for us to help people who are on the webinar identify some of the signals that that, that seem to suggest that their organization is once, once again reverting, right? And, and giving into that hysteresis um, well, to go back to, to old ways. So you'll touch in there because of, I think we've already seen one of the first signals coming out um, from Safe Work Australia and, and, and Safe Work New, New South Wales, who um, have uh, just issued, you know, a whole lot of instructions about, you know, operating in the COVID uh, uh, environment. And it, it seems to be emboldening um, the process, right, we need to think about structure and process and rules. I, I don't know whether you or Michael got any ob observations, you know, uh, about those signals and uh, and how we should uh, treat them. I've never seen a controversy that I haven't bought into, so uh, let, me, <laughs> let me start. Let me start. I've got to be on brand, guys. I've got to be on brand. Um, th there's an interesting debate um, uh, that is playing out at the moment between Safe Work Australia and the, uh, the union movement. Um, and um, Safe Work Australia is saying um, the right approach in relation to a, a post-COVID return to work arrangement is the guidance that we have put together. Um, uh, the, uh, the union movement is saying we need new laws um, because uh, we need to ensure that by 
uh, propagating new laws, uh, we can protect uh, workers. Um, it probably wouldn't surprise anyone on this call, knowing me, um, they're both wrong with respect um, to them. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the reality is that um, we, we actually, the existing rules are not adequate for a post-COVID environment, but not for the reasons that, that the union movement is articulating. The reason that the existing rules are not, as in the laws, are not adequate for a post-COVID environment is because there are too many of them. Um, and, and a lot of them are actually not risk-based at all. There are a lot of procedural administrative requirements that uh, in the new world, uh, you actually couldn't possibly uh, comply with in a way in which it is, it is designed. Uh, and, and one of the points that, that has emerged from this is actually um, if there is a role for the safety regulator in relation to, um, to health and safety enforcement, don't they need to know if there is a, a, a COVID incident um, so that, can, that they, they can actually take an interest in, and investigate it? And the rules on that are not clear. I mean, what, what, what you would need is um, something other than the actual um, event, which, which would be hospitalisation, for example. So you wouldn't be notified of the, the actual um, uh, incident you'd be notified, um, um, you know, when it, when it, uh, when it has turned, um, you know, uh, bad. Um, you know, th there would need to be some other trigger um, in, uh, in the actual uh, reporting requirements. And then you overlay that with a whole bunch of requirements that are uh, not fit for purpose, um, that, uh, that, are, that are rather designed for, um, you know, loads of inspections. Well, if you think about a risk-based approach to, um, to, to uh, consultation, uh, that 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 uh, uh, that engages in uh, inspections and checklists uh, type of mentality. What you end up with is actually exposing more people to um, to to risk, um, not less people to risk. So, it, for we have been on this journey for some time of actually taking a long hard look at whether our rules, uh, in fact, um, are are fit for purpose uh, in the sense that uh, they actually live up to the hype of being truly performance-based, being outcome-based, being, being, um, giving people uh, the, what we as a group talk about, freedom within a framework. Um, and uh, there's a lot of rhetoric around that. But in actual fact, what you end up with is a combination of both. Um, yes, operating rules, which are basically about the duty of care, and then on a few hobby issues um, that, are, that have historical context, um, loads of uh, administrative requirements uh, that, that over, over, overload uh, the, um, the system and don't actually add a great deal of value necessarily uh, from a, um, a health and safety outcome perspective. And if you're looking for evidence of that, uh, I challenge the people on this call to um, read through um, all of the requirements in relation to consultation. Now, let me say this before people um, uh, jump on the, the, the Q&A and, uh, and hurl abuse. I, I always welcome it, but, uh, but on this occasion, I'll just cut it off in this way. It, I'm not saying that, that, that um, worker engagement um, is a bad thing. In fact, I'm saying the opposite. Um, what we need is proper worker yeah. engagement. We actually need a bottom-up approach. Yeah. What I'm saying is that the bureaucracy of um, what is um, touted as worker engagement is not worker engagement at all. No. It's just bureaucracy yeah. um, and not achieving the purpose of the objective of actually engaging, getting insights from workers in relation to how work is done. What are the challenges um, in relation to getting work done? Um, what, are, what are the things that, um, uh, and we talk about this as a group, what are the things that make work hard? Uh, what are the things that make work easy? Mm -hmm. um, and how do we lean into those things? Because that's the real conversation we need to be having, mm -hmm. not a conversation about, um, you know, uh, do we have enough um, uh, uh, fire exits and are they unblocked and have we done enough inspections and, um, you know, can we, have, um, can we have the minutes of the last meeting, please? Um, those things, with, with respect, um, don't really add a great deal of value uh, in relation to the safety outcome. Thanks, Michael. I might pass across to Rosa because you've now, in touching on the consultation piece, you're touching on engagement and relationship in, in organisations. And Rosa, I'd be interested in your observations um, about now um, how what we've learned in COVID and the experiences uh, we've had uh, have uh, changed the way that we, we think about um, uh, relationships uh, in our workplaces and what should we be taking forward into the emergent um, COVID world. 
um, Rosa, you. Sorry, there we go. I, I had to unmute myself. Uh, that's that. There's a huge range of issues there, all the way from the larger social, the economic crisis that we're in. People uh, have lost their jobs. Um, they're uh, many. We lost family members. Uh, so there's there's a great deal of pain, uh, and and there's this whole workforce that were considered essential workers, that in a sense are low paid workers that are asked to risk their lives. So all of this has created for the U.S. I don't know how it is where you are, but it has created a great deal of negative uh, lack of trust. Um, and especially with our political party, lack of transparency. So I think that we are, that the, leader, uh, the leaders of our organizations have been that, uh, that our, le our country's leader did not fill, uh, which is to provide a, a clear uh, plan, a, a direction, right? And to look at um, some of the uh, ways that people can continue working and remain safe because there's uh look at the meat industry people don't want to go back you know they're saying yeah we're, we're essential workers basically you're saying that we should die we should be willing to die mm -hmm. so these are these are pretty uh deep relationship issues uh and the way that uh i've seen some companies have treated their workers very fairly and and people talk about that. They say, uh, you know, they're, they're probably going to be loyal till the end because they feel they've gotten, they got the protection they needed. They, uh, if they needed, um, uh, you know, time off, they got paid. And there's this whole other group that um, uh, are laid off. They're, they're just, you know, uh, they're not considered essential. And so they're let go. And then you ask those people, how are you going to serve those people back into the workforce? I think it's going to be a huge challenge for safety professionals, uh, well, for leadership, really. But safety professionals always have the brunt of these uh, negative downturns because of the, uh, the low trust and the attitude that people have towards management and the company, right? So that, that's the area where I've been working, uh, which is uh, consulting with leaders about how to manage uh, you know, their communication and, and managing this, the uncertainty during this COVID. And then uh, not assuming that when everybody comes to work, they can just go back to normal. They can't. Yeah. I think was that I don't know. On a point. We need to talk about what that's going to look like. Yeah. Yeah. As we go back to work, um, and part of the assumption is, that as we sort of uh, uh, particularly do this um, uh, emerging um, uh, from lockdown, that we just simply need to apply the rules that we've already got, like social distancing, uh, for example, and apply that in the workplace and. Um, and that seems to uh, fail to, to recognise that that's going to be quite a difficult challenge in many workplaces. So the simplicity um, of a lot of work, and if you want to observe what happens in many workplaces like the meatpacking construction sites, um, um, even in healthcare, uh, even in our office space where we're going to have to congregate and take lifts um, up into our offices, um, it, it won't be as simple as just saying there's a simple rule um, to put in place and it will all work. It will it will require some sort of adaptive. So I'm just interested in the panel's views that um, about this simplistic view, you know, of what the process will be when we emerge to work and how we're going to actually bring that into practice into uh, work and adapt to that environment. It's, it's always interesting to, uh, sorry, Michael, it's always interesting to see the, um, mm. if you said this uh, along a larger historical arc, you can see that for the last 150 years, there has been a tendency, particularly in Anglo cultures, uh, surprisingly, to uh, to revert back more to uh, hierarchical control and rulemaking to manage these sorts of uncertainties. Um, 1870, I'm talking, um, the U.S. sent uh, two of its officers to uh, to study the Prussian military system because they'd become quite fascinated by what the Prussians already at that time called Auftragstaktik, right? 
Uh, it took until the 1930s for the Americans to finally find a label to translate that, and they screwed it up. They called it Mission Command. And, and in the U.S., Mission Command was always confused with better bureaucratic ordering, more mm-hmm. bureaucratic efficiency, better ways in which you get stuff from the top to the bottom and back up and back and forth along the hierarchy. That's never what the Germans or the Prussians uh, intended it to mean. Um, right, Auftragstatik is the sense of giving your local leaders, right, or even people who aren't leaders but take up a leadership responsibility, um, the, the freedom, the liberty within the frame of particular uh, objectives and other constraints to achieve the objective. But you're not going to tell them how to do it, right? Mm-hmm. And I think we have shown beautifully in this crisis that people are perfectly capable of doing this. Right. If the mission is stay healthy, don't get COVID, um, you know, and, and I fully agree with Rosa that there are um, uh, configurations in our in our uh, uh, in our political economy that make it impossible for some people to do that because they are sacrificial for various reasons. And ultimately, the, the, the cost and the destruction of a crisis like this will find its way along the break lines, along the fissures in society that run on poverty and race and and economic inequality. And, it, it, and and that was always so as well. You know, you go back to the Middle Ages and you see the same thing with the plague, for example. So that's not new. Um, but what's fascinating is that 150 years after you Anglo first starts dabbling in these other ways of structuring and giving people freedom within a frame, you still get it wrong. You still say, we need to give people uh, more rules to do these things. But what we fail to understand is that, and, and again, the, I'm not saying they figured it out altogether, but, but the Prussians understood that you need three things in your people for this to work, right? You need, you need knowledge, they need to know stuff. So yes, you gotta give them some knowledge about how this thing um, uh, transmits, how the immune system responds, whatever, right? So give them some knowledge. The second one is you gotta give them the independence. But the third is you have to look for what the Germans beautifully called the, the Verantwortungsfreudigkeit, the joy at taking responsibility. Right. And you can celebrate this. You can give it to people and and making sure that you imbue these values in your people, I think, will lead to good outcomes. Right. And well, let's not confuse the recovery uh, with indeed the word recovery, because you don't want to recover back to where we were. Uh, let's understand this as resilience. Right. An increase in adaptive capacity, taking us to a new place, a better place. Michael, sorry. Back no, not at all. I, I, I'll piggyback off um, some of your comments, which were right on, right on point. I mean, in a sense, we are um, in a battle on, on, on ideology, just, just picking mm. up on some of the, mm. um, what, uh, what Rosa has, uh, oh, yeah. um, has said. Um, and, and what we've seen work through this process is the more trust you give people, the more information you provide them, the more honest conversations you have, even difficult conversations, but they're honest conversations um, that say, well, for, for, uh, in those circumstances, we as a, um, as a society cannot afford for these jobs not to be done. So we're going to do the best that we can to put controls in place. Then you're bringing people along um, on the journey of understanding why, in their case, these, these are their circumstances, as opposed to someone else um, who has the luxury of working in an office environment who simply gets to to stay at home and and and, and work at home even difficult conversations around uh, that we're we're, we're, uh, we're currently ha- having about um whether certain tasks are really necessary and and, and i was going to pivot at uh, that to, to to say to make this uh this comment i think the most positive thing that has come out of um uh, covid 19 um crisis and the lockdown is um it's allowed us to not only rationalise the rules, but also reflect on how many tasks are really truly necessary mm-hmm. and whether the way we are doing things is the only way to do things. And, and if we think about the hierarchy of controls, elimination is the top of the hierarchy of controls. There's a whole bunch of tasks that we are doing just to do them. Um, there's a whole bunch of counting that we do just to count. There's a whole bunch of orders that, that, that we do just to do orders and feel good about, 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 about um, um, auditing. Um, beyond safety, there's a whole bunch of um, uh, administrative tasks and, um, and repetitive tasks that have been eliminated through this process, and the world has not caved in. The economy has not caved in. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things that we need to do when we, when, when we go back, um, uh, which in some jurisdictions is imminent, 
uh, is reflect on whether we need to necessarily go back to normal or whether there is a new normal which has a, a number of, um, uh, of ways of doing things differently. Uh, reimagining work in a way that is more efficient, uh, that, 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 um, uh, that provides more autonomy to people, uh, that actually uh, reflects um, the, the, uh, uh, the, the reality that uh, we have exposed a number of tasks to actually be redundant um, in, uh, in our system. The second thing is that uh, consistent with the hierarchy of controls, we know that businesses went to isolation here um, uh, very quickly. The government went to isolation very quickly, as in, and not just in isolation as the language we talk about in relation to COVID-19, but actually removing people from the risk by asking them to stay at home or to, um, to engage in, uh, in what's been termed social isolation techniques, to actually remove them from the risk of exposure. Now, I hope we remember that lesson when we go back to work um, and apply it across a number of risk um, areas and not just immediately forget it and go down, straight down, two runs down and look for administrative controls like safe working procedures, uh, like training instruction and information uh, and other uh, useless things. I think Sorry, well, can I say that out loud? No, no, you do. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll edit the time we'll, we'll later. Please um, don't. But, uh, um, it was deliberate. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I think there, there, there's... Uh, one key pivot point that's come out of what each of you have said is a connection to purpose. And what we've been able to do with COVID, you know, if you if you want to frame this in this way, what COVID has been good for is giving us a common purpose and a focus on, on the purpose uh, and the objective. And that's allowed to happen what, what Sydney, you know, and, and Michael, you both talked about. It then says, well, let's re revisit this thing and focus on you know, what we're trying to do and work, work, work towards that objective. So um, I think that, that, that could be one of the, the lessons to take forward is how, you know, how do you keep that focus on purpose when the purpose isn't COVID um, going through and apply the same insights, Michael and, and Sydney, that you, you've given. Yeah. Uh, Sydney, I think I, I, I found it was wonderful that you, you found the, the guidance for our leaders to, coming from the Prussians and the Germans, you know, and uh, so modern leadership, you know, is it's always worth revisiting history, you know, to, uh, uh, to find some of the answers. But I think what, we've talked a bit about leaders and we've talked about regulators to some degree and a range of other things. Is, is there any insights that we should be providing to our safety professionals um, in this uh, post-COVID world? Because they, they're always you know, the meat in the sandwich. They're, um, they're between the pressures that come from the unions and the workers and you've got pressures from leadership and pressures from regulators. What should they be doing differently in this emergent world? Well, it, it, picks, up, it picks up my next point, which is the fourth point in my um, five, five points that I wanted to make um, at the outset. One of the things that this crisis has exposed, Kelvin, um, uh, Sydney and Rosa, uh, is that a lot of our rules are actually... Um, bias towards the things that we can see immediately um, and, um, and the things that um, happen frequently. COVID, if nothing else, I mean, there's examples of, of, of a pandemic, is quite clearly a high consequences, low frequency uh, type of event. We, we, we would not have anticipated this sort of thing um, happening uh, in, in, our, uh, um, uh, in our workplaces, uh, although... Uh, you would have thought that the threat of contagion given SARS and everything else has gone on before um, uh, uh, would, would, uh, would have given us a clue to actually be prepared for some of those things. Um, the reality is that uh, many workplaces were found uh, not to have been um, ready for it. And they've shown adaptive capacity and um, full credit to the ability to pivot and, um, um, and, um, and do that. Uh, but it's exposed the reality that actually we create our safety procedures and systems for what we see. And what we see is the stuff that happens all the time. And that happens to be the low consequences, high frequency events. Um, and uh, so there is a, there's a real bias around, um, uh, around that. And, and one of the opportunities to reflect for the safety professionals is recalibrating that, um, actually uh, reflecting on whether that should be the, the, the purpose, um, uh, the, the approach, uh, whether in fact uh, you should uh, 
uh, relax some of the requirements uh, in relation to uh, the you know those events that are um, you know, kind of a, a you know lower lower in the uh, consequences um, um, order. Trust people more in that and focus your energies on things that have those higher consequences. And you mentioned regulators, and I wanted to to to, to bring on the last point because I'm really interested in the panel's view uh, around that. I, one of the things that people um, mistakenly um, uh, interpret uh, in relation to the safety differently, uh, the safety two uh, movement uh, is, um, you know, this, this perception that actually what people like me want uh, is uh, there would be no rules or no laws or no, 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 no regulations. I, I want you to reflect on uh, what's occurring around us. The reality is that as soon as you signal um, to uh, a, a regulated community that there is some limitation uh, in your ability, whether you're OSHA or HSC um, uh, in the UK uh, or uh, one of the safe work authorities in Australia, there's going to be some relaxation uh, in your engagement and enforcement of, um, of the rules. The pressure to prioritise safety um, comes off. Uh, and fundamentally, if you are going to apply a functioning, strong and effective freedom within a framework a approach, you need the framework to be very diligently enforced because of the framework, if, if the, those boundaries that we're creating uh, are not enforced, if they're lax, then what you're describing is ultimately anarchy. And, and sadly, we're starting to see the consequences of that uh, at the moment around the world, but, but particularly because, because of the COVID numbers, we know that they're not COVID related necessarily or directly COVID related in Australia. A large number of recent incidents, fatal incidents, um, and, and, um, and major uh, incidents that have occurred in the last month or so uh, that reflect, um, in fact, uh, what might be the sign of things to come. Now, no doubt, uh, mindfulness is a factor here. People are distracted. Uh, disruption of supply chain is a factor here because you know, things are not, uh, are not their, their norm. Um, uh, and, um, and, and all of those things will play uh, a part. But it's actually... Uh, the focus of businesses to ensure that people have the resources they need when they need them um, and, um, uh, and the means to do the work um, safely requires uh, for uh, that um, role, strong role of a regulator in relation to the important rules, um, the rules that, that set that framework. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. I want to uh, add a, uh, or ask your opinion, Michael, because you use the word enforcement because we have, uh, and I understand, you know, there's this framework and then you have uh, the autonomy to operate within the framework, which I really like. But I think that uh, reliance on regulators for that enforcement might not be uh, feasible. Mm. Uh, and the reason it goes back to how relationships operate, the social mm. system in the organization operate, which is that you, you're basically uh, supervised by your social norms and your, the expectations around you. You're not supervised by the regulators on a mm. minute-by-minute minute basis. So if we are going to create these frameworks, um, then we really have to look at, and I, this is why, I, why I'm saying this is an opportunity for us. The crisis is an opportunity to rethink how we are educating and training our workers, um, which is to give them the skills so that they can create those boundaries consciously and realize what their role is in reinforcing those. Uh, Sydney earlier said that, you know, self-accountability is, is one of the, the hallmarks of this working, right? But self-accountability only comes after people's social needs are met. Are you, you know, do you respect me? Do you include me? Do you value me? Do you recognize me? So that whole aspect, and that's what my book is about, <laughs> because that whole aspect of education is missing from the safety professional uh, education. Sydney, just you, um, any observations or comments into just what's just been said? 
the um, uh, the misconceptions that uh, that safety differently or safety two would indeed, as Michael says, uh, would be uh, uh, a movement against rulemaking and certainly against government uh, rulemaking. Um, it's a, it's a strong misconception and um, uh, and it is unfortunate. Uh, and I uh, I think Rosa adds uh, some some from real uh, yeah, important great. points to that too. Um, but if you look at the more nuanced versions of the debate and the scholarship around this, it is actually, um, uh, it, it takes aim more at how free markets create more rules and more nonsensical rules because of a variety of factors, um, including the sheer fact that we now have a market for more safety bureaucracy where, where individual little companies can come up and help you write a bigger SMS than you actually really need. Um, making you know, lawyers like Michael make people really afraid, so they have, uh, have lots of legal protections and liability management in order to. Uh, I, but you see where I'm going, right? And no, so, no. Um, uh, the only correction I'll make is not like Michael. No, so not like Michael. So people <laughs> unlike Michael, yeah, exactly. Colleagues that are not like Michael um, uh, make boards really afraid and anxious for liability claims, and so so they they overcompensate with all kinds of stuff that the regulator never asked for. Um, in fact, I would be the first to say that the past 40 years of market-oriented policymaking in the West, and particularly Anglo countries, and the neutering and emasculation of regulatory authority and capacity uh, has been a bad thing um, because the markets have made up for it and overcompensated with lots of nonsense of themselves, which actually doesn't protect workers well, right? Uh, as the incidents that Michael alluded to, as Rosa illustrates, um, and as as, uh, as as Michael was commenting on the uh, the low sorry the the, the, the high visibility or and, and, and high frequency but you know low consequence events um, we protect them against that sort of nonsense right which anybody yeah, yeah. so um, uh, the argument is far subtler than that now if you go back to uh, to uh, Rosa's point um, uh, work from from the 1970s Rolston and others who look at how kinship relations and uh, other workplace relations were actually responsible for imbuing people with, with a particular set of values that, it, that they coordinated and, and, and rallied around. There was no need for safety rules, right? They were able to create safe outcomes on the basis of those relationships. Would that we have the capacity now to once again, back to what Michael was saying, give people the confidence and the trust to rely on those relationships, to develop those relationships, to entrust those relationships and value them. So we get the outcomes we all want and that cannot be imposed from the top down. And if I, if I, uh, if I give you an example, um, Sydney, a lot of the what, what drives this kind of culture uh, comes out of the question you ask. Let me illustrate. Uh, if, if someone came to me and said, um, uh, I, I, I uh, in my private life drive a car, uh, is it possible uh, that I could go to jail um, for, for driving a car? The answer is yes. Uh, if you are negligent in, 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 in your driving, you could be liable for all sorts of um, traffic offences. Hang on, I just want to say if yeah. you are found negligent. Found negligent. negligent is an yeah. attribution yeah. of a behaviour. <laughs> there is no such thing as negligent yeah. behaviour. Right? It doesn't no, fit good, a psychological good, textbook. Good, so if good, you are good. found negligent, sorry, good, go good. ahead. So if you're found, if you're found, found by, by court to be negligent, uh, and um, then there is all sorts of uh, traffic offences uh, that, 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 um, uh, that, that apply. And in fact, if that negligence is so gross that it would fall within the category of recklessness, right, a more serious category of, uh, of negligence, um, and you're found to have been reckless uh, in, in that context, you could go to jail for manslaughter for driving a car. Now, are you going to write any different rules or behave any differently uh, or, um, or uh, shift your risk profile uh, as a result of that piece of knowledge? Well, the answer for all of us would be no, I am very careful and cautious in the way that I do it. I do it because I don't want to kill anybody while, while I'm driving. Um, and, 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 and for the most part, um, that makes sense um, to me. I'm not going to alter my behavior with that piece of knowledge. Now, you overlay that to the debate in relation to things like industrial manslaughter, for example, and all of a sudden you've got huge reactions to penalties that apply to extreme behavior that um, if you sat down with someone and said, would you, would you engage in that kind of behavior? They would say, well, no, hell no, I wouldn't engage in that kind of behavior. No, okay. um, uh, yet, yet we have a, an extreme pivot and overreaction 
uh, that that reflects that, and and that's that seems to be to be the the um, um, uh, the the uh, um, this illogical emotional reaction to the legal framework that applies to uh, to health and safety uh, offences. It, 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 it's it's in and that that drives a lot of the debate around whether it's fair or right that there be um, penalties in that in that order. But everyone who argues in in relation to that point wouldn't engage in the sort of conduct that would warrant that kind of penalty. So um, what I say to people is that this is largely irrelevant. I wouldn't write the rules for that 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 risk. Uh, I'd be looking at um, how do I protect my people and how do I make sure that. That, that people um, are not um, seriously injured uh, or killed at work? Um, and how do I um, create uh, the boundaries that we're talking about, the, the, the framework that we're talking about um, for that? And, and to pick up on Rose's um, question, I think it's a very astute question and, 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 and agree with her wholeheartedly. For the most part, workplaces are, are unregulated because it's not feasible for the regulators to get to, um, to enough workplaces to have any meaningful impact. For the most part, the regulation of safety, despite all the talk of proactivity, is an entirely reactive event. An incident happens that has the consequences that we're talking about, um, and a regulator is therefore moved to attend to that incident and investigate it. Um, so the best form of legal protection, legal risk management you can adopt, and you've heard me say this many, many times, don't have the incident in the first place. That is the best legal strategy you can adopt. You don't have the incident in the first place. And I'm not about that don't have incidents because you will have incidents. What I'm talking about is don't have a, a fatality, a serious incident um, that, 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 that causes serious injury uh, or has that, that quite clear potential as an explosion, that, those, those major events. Um, if you steer your system towards preventing those rather than um, preventing the low consequences uh, events that we, we're discussing, uh, or in some businesses, suppressing those events, not actually dealing with them, but just suppressing the reporting of those events um, uh, 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 openly or covertly um, through, through incentives um, and, uh, and, and cultural pressure, then, uh, then you will have better outcomes from a legal perspective, from a safety perspective, um, and from an overall functioning perspective. And the sort of ingredients that go into that are the stuff that Rosa's talking about, which is building trust, engaging with people, getting to understand um, why people are not able to do the work as you imagine it to be, hmm. uh, getting that insight. That, that they're, not, they're, not, they're not out there trying to flaunt the rules because they're flaunting the rules. Um, their reality is different to what you imagine it to be. Um, and so rather than think in theoretical terms, um, you've got to gain and systematically gain that insight, which is t takes us back to the, the, the engagement debate. The engagement debate shouldn't be about how do I create a process for engagement? It should be how do I institutionalize um, this idea of a workforce up approach rather than a management down approach. So we're about to um, move into open forum uh, questions um, and I might just get a, a, a very quick uh, response from each of the panel members is as we've taken all of this on board, we've been, you know, going through the COVID experience, what would you like to see, you know, as the future state, you know, of uh, workplaces um, as we've uh, come out of COVID, uh, you know, uh, what would be the attributes you, you would like to see? So, might, Rosa, I might start with you. Well, this feeling of we're all in this together has been one of the most positive aspects of, um, of this experience. Uh, the social connections uh, with friends and family and, and my colleagues also. There's been because people have more time for uh, conversation or also writing on LinkedIn. Uh, there's been some fantastic conversations uh, that people have been having. Uh, and you can see that uh, people have been deeply impacted. Uh, 
for example, on some of the sites with the safety professionals, uh, they, they're talking about how this is the first time that senior management has engaged them and invited them to the table. Uh, and so that's another opportunity for us. We say crisis brings opportunity. That's another opportunity. How do we maintain that sense of urgency that safety and health belongs at the table? Not, not be consulted after we make all of these decisions. And if you're only consulted about rules, uh, you're, you're missing a whole aspect of, of what it really takes to have a safety and health um, community that holds itself accountable. So I would say that would be my dream would be to have safety and health uh, professionals sit, have a seat at the table and to maintain we're all in this together. Thanks. Uh, Sydney? My ideal would be to see that the curiosity that um, I think we, uh, we would want to impart to people, for them to want to understand how this could go right, how this could go well, what the adaptive capacity on the various front lines was um, in order to actually make stuff happen. Um, not come with a judgmental mindset, not come with a framework of rules, um, but come with a curiosity. How did they actually make this work? Yeah. And I think that once you start discovering that and, and, and be relentlessly empirical about this, right? Just want to find out how people did this on the front lines. Um, you will discover that people made sacrifices and, um, uh, that, and we, you see that even happening now, making sacrifices to achieve greater productive output um, for, for their system, their mind and you know, whatever it is uh, in order to accelerate out of the crisis. But if you want to prevent that from going off the rails, going really wrong, creating fatalities, creating uh, 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 trade-offs at the organizational level that we wouldn't want to see, then the only way to predict that is to understand how people create success and understand the sacrifices they make in, in, in creating that success. Because it is in those sacrifices, some of which matter, many of which don't matter, um, it is in those sacrifices that the kernels, the seeds of greater trouble might well lie. And that you need to, need to make as a topic of conversation um, and, and discovery and reflection and perhaps uh, adjustment. But you can only do that with a mindset of appreciation of adaptive capacity, of frontline empowerment, and curiosity about how they did it. Thanks, Sydney. I think excellent insight. And Michael, your, your closing thoughts? Uh, for me, one of the key lessons out of all this has been trust. Oh. All those people have said that um, I'm not getting productivity out of, out of people um, and, um, or I can't trust them to work from home. Now they've learned that actually you can get greater productivity if you just trust people um, to, um, to work in, in a working from home environment. Um, if we take that key lesson of trust, um, how do we start to trust our people? How do we engender that? Um, and how do we uh, continue to earn uh, that trust um, from them? There's a lot of goodwill in organisations. Um, and one of the myths of, um, uh, of uh, the debate that has gone on is people seem to think that an organisation or a company is its management or leadership or officers. It's not. Uh, it's its people. Uh, that is what the organisation is. And that's what has been shown um, through this crisis. And part of this is one of the things that are going to come out of this is people are going to be interested uh, in the resilience of an organization. We've seen a lot of innovation from various organizations through this operationally, um, coming up with new ways of doing things, new ways of operating, despite the adversity that we've all seen. I wonder whether over time, the real test, the real value of an organization won't be based on uh, its earnings um, or its um, uh, a beta or some other um, financial measure, but will actually be in large part a measure of its resilience. Because if I was to invest some money, I'd want to invest it in an organization that's going to be around when the next two, three crises, disruptions and crises come up, uh, mm -hmm. rather than one that, it, that is going to fall victim to those things. Um, the and the market is going to be very interested in, in that. I, I think that's exactly right. Well, thank, thanks, panel. Um, we're just about to uh, open it up to the floor and we'll give you some instructions shortly about how to join um, the panel discussion. Um, thank you. 
Thank you for taking the time to join today's webinar. An email has just been sent to you with a link to an extended Q&A panel discussion that is happening right now. We'll be able to host the first 250 people who attend the live extended Q&A. If you miss out, don't worry. We'll be recording the extended panel discussion and we will send out the recording link to you so you can watch at a convenient time. Thanks again for joining today's webinar and we hope you have found it helpful. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Mark McLaren and uh, <clears throat> you had the misfortune of seeing me right at the end of the uh, today's uh, excellent uh, live webinar. Uh, we have uh, with us uh, Rosa and Michael who are going to uh, engage with you in a live uh, q and I already can see there's quite a few people online. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping rules before we get started. Uh, firstly, if um, you could make sure that you have yourself on mute, uh, that will really help and uh, will ensure that we don't get any uh, sort of background noise happening. That's the first thing. Secondly, we welcome you uh, to turn your video on. It's uh, great to be able to look at people, and we know that we have people uh, gathered from across the globe uh, to engage uh, in what is a really important discovery of, you know, what is it that we've actually learned through COVID-19 that we can take forward uh, in our recovery strategy? And, and how can we build this greater sense of uh, adaptive capacity uh, and resilience? And I think that uh, uh, Sydney and uh, Michael and Rosa, you uh, put forward uh, a really interesting case. And I'm sure that this case uh, is going to spark uh, some considerable debate. Uh, and uh, as uh, you probably have discovered, uh, neither Michael uh, or Rosa uh, are afraid of, um, of transparent, honest, uh, constructive, robust discussion. Uh, I think I'm not overselling that, Michael or Rosa. Uh, just a couple of other housekeeping things. You'll see in the top right-hand corner of the screen uh, a little bubble. And what we'd like you to do um, is you can, you can chat uh, during this discussion, uh, but our team will be monitoring that and uh, asking uh, from that questions. So what we'd like you to do, you think, well, how do I get to ask my question in such a large gathering of people? It's not a problem. Just put in the chat function, I'd like to ask Michael a question about whatever it might be. And our team will be monitoring that. Uh, and then they'll bring that question uh, to uh, Michael and uh, to Rosa. And at that point, I'll ask you to unmute yourself. So you can then interact. And it might be a question. It might be an observation. Uh, it might be something that you want to fundamentally take to task uh, with Michael and Rosa. And uh, again, uh, that in a constructive manner uh, is, um, is welcomed. So with that in mind, there's another person I'd like to introduce you uh, today, and that is Rod Cameron. Uh, Rod is a member of the Art of Work team, and he has been super busy uh, monitoring uh, questions in the chat on uh, YouTube Live. So um, I'm going to hand over to you, Rod, uh, to get this discussion started and uh, to direct questions to uh, Michael and Rosa. Uh, once we get uh, going, we'll monitoring the chat function up in the top right hand corner. And uh, then I'll actually come to you, ask you to unmute yourself, and then you can ask a question or offer an observation. Um, uh, so to over to yeah. you, please. Uh, just before Rod, it's Kelvin speaking, Mark. Uh, look, I just will note that um, uh, obviously Sydney Decker is not on uh, this call. Uh, Sydney was with us until a few minutes ago and um, has actually gone had to attend to an urgent personal matter. Um, so uh, we do pass on an apology that Sydney was very keen to, to enter the, the, the following discussion. Um, but uh, we will certainly take anything that you raise and, and connect that with, with Sydney. But he does offer his, uh, his apology. Great. Thanks, Kelvin. And uh, yes, it was disappointing that he had to uh, suddenly uh, take off. But I know he would have been, of all people, uh, looking forward to this conversation and uh, further exploring the ideas. So I'm going to hand over to you, Rod. Thanks, uh, to Mark. Ask the first question. 
Thanks, Mark. Uh, the first question's for Michael. Michael, what do you say to the notion that the community wanted or needed the security of rules during a pandemic? I'd question that. Um, <clears throat> I saw that comment um, that was offered in um, uh, the the, um, uh, the YouTube chat. I, I will say this: uh, for the most part, I've, I've been I've been monitoring closely the YouTube um, uh, commentary, and I have to say, with respect. Um, you're very insightful people because um, for the most part you agreed with everything I said, so you must be right. Um, <laughs> but um, um, uh, let me let me take issue with this idea. I think people like um, the uh, some structure, <clears throat> and I think most people that I that I've spoken to, businesses that I've spoken to, uh, like the certainty of um, uh, it's on, it's off. Um, you can you can open, you can close um, uh, because it 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 removes uh, the uncertainty that's associated with having to make uh, those decisions for, for yourself. So I get um, the, the desire for that level of, uh, of guidance. It makes things um, simpler. Uh, where I think we, um, we struggle with, uh, with the rules and, and, and guidance is when they're more nuanced. And we're, we're going through a phase at the moment in Australia where we're about to see that. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, some businesses are allowed to open, but with certain um, hard restrictions. Um, and uh, it'd be interesting to see how many, in fact, open um, and how many can manage uh, those, uh, those rules and restrictions in a practical way, uh, in a way that uh, they can still maintain their operation um, and, um, and do so efficiently in a, in, a, in a compliant way. And the more we overlay complexity um, to a situation, um, with uh, with rules, strict rules, uh, the the less uh, the, the the less we actually uh, achieve in this context. So uh, it, it's 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 an interesting debate. Uh, we will uh, be seeing it roll out as um, not just Australia, but um, most jurisdictions around the world start to open up, uh, and uh, there is there seems to be a similar model around the world uh, in relation to introducing um, some um, adjusted. Uh, rules around uh, how we we are to uh, to interact, um, and to my mind, the simpler the rules, the simpler, the clearer the messages, uh, the better off we are. Uh, but uh, but but you know, here we go. We, we're all going to be experiencing it together. Thanks, Michael. Um, I've got a question here for Rosa. Rosa, how does a lack of trust undermine what we're trying to achieve around COVID nineteen? That's a great question uh, because. Trust uh, is the only reason that we believe our leaders when they're giving us information. If we trust them, then we feel that they're being transparent and giving us uh, information to the best of their knowledge. So that's at the highest level, government level, political. And in our organizations, uh, it's interesting that uh, Gallup in April did a poll in the U.S., of uh, what employees felt um, was creating the trust in their organization. And they said, uh, my organization cares about me. Unfortunately, when they went about uh, finding out how many people felt their organization cared about them, it was at 45%. So that's in the US, hopefully it's higher in Australia. But really it's uh, trust is the essence of communication understood by both sides because if i don't trust you i can't believe you all right thanks rosa michael one more for you um as we as companies do go back to work uh how much engagement and consultation should they do uh before they, they embark on that with their workforce a oh, tremendous amount i mean i think uh, what what people need to do is actually have conversations uh, with their their workers about what is uh, in fact involved in doing the work, um, and what I mean by a tremendous amount is um, not not the the processes that um, that I was criticising in our discussion, but actually genuine conversation, uh, because um, you know the, the the way in which work needs to be done um, in in a in a COVID disrupted um, uh, setting requires actually careful uh, thought uh, and thought that is based on uh, what the actual activities are that are that are involved uh, and how they're going to be achieved and so uh, a genuine 
consultation, a genuine discussion. Um, I'd almost call it um, a joint planning um, is uh, is required to achieve a a safe um, a safe transition uh, back. So uh, a real genuine engagement with with workers um, to uh, get insights into how work is done and how it can be done uh, in this disrupted environment uh, in, a, in a safe manner um, and, um, and, and really be open to ideas uh, from them uh, and, uh, and, and look for ways to, to accommodate that. And you'll find that the, it, it's the, the devil's going to be in the detail. It's going to be the, the little things. Um, it's going to be, you know, insight in, into uh, parts of the workplace that are being used that you even know are being used. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it's the it's the detail around uh, doors that should be uh, left open um, when normally they are uh, they're closed to minimise contact points. It's uh, you know, it's those sort of things. Um, it's challenging whether certain deliveries are required in the usual way to minimise the number of people that are coming into uh, the workforce. Uh, it's that that sort of consideration that's required. Mm -hmm. Can I add something to that, Michael? Um, one of the things that has come out, especially, uh, well, this is what I, I've heard from the healthcare organizations, is that um, typically certain members of the workforce have felt um, disregarded and sidelined. And all of a sudden now through the crisis, people have begun to realize their value and what an important role they play. So it goes to your point that as we go forward to uh, figure out you know, what should be done, that we have to be very inclusive. And that's one of the things that we learned from the COVID crisis and hope that, that we can carry forward that feeling of mutual respect and appreciation. Yeah. Yep. If I could just build on that, Rosa, um, James has asked a really uh, interesting question. So James, if you're able to unmute yourself, I know that you've got a great question about how could you take the organisational learning of strengthening relationships that we've discovered through COVID-19. And I thought it was really interesting, uh, Rosa, was around then uh, benefiting future risk management. So over to you, James, for your question. Uh, fill it out and uh, I'll let Rosa and then maybe Michael, you might want to jump on the back end of Rosa's answer. Yeah, I guess I was interested in um, the opportunities going forward. Um, and so we will have learned things about relationships within and across organisations. Um, you've obviously written a lot about organisational relationships and how they uh, relate to risk management and safety. And I'm wondering what lessons we might be able to use uh, in future, um, unrelated perhaps to uh, COVID-19. Um, what, uh, what can we do to strengthen those organisational relationships in future? Yeah. Well... For the organizations that did well uh, in the COVID and were able to maintain their relationships with employees uh, to the level of trust by showing that they cared by telling that um, they um, that we want to take care of them. For for example, um, Jody uh, Jatel at Brandeis did a study. Uh, this was from the 9-11 crisis where she found that the airline companies that didn't do layoffs are the ones that are financially successful now. Uh, so these things have uh, carry a lot of power uh, in terms of gaining loyalty and, and loyalty trust, um, which is the leaders to really be transparent and honest about the information they have, to show empathy, uh, acknowledge anxiety uh, and share the pain, share the pain with workers. So these are things that took place in some companies during the COVID, but they are the ones that have always worked. They, they've always been the, uh, the way to create and maintain relationships. Michael, what did you, what did you, what would you add to that? I, I can't act to perfection, Rosa. <laughs> I mean, it's really, but it's really interesting, Rosa, the point that's being made because mm -hmm. you think at the heart, Michael, of what you were challenging. I, I was very impressed that you got Sid to a point of of, of acknowledging where boundaries um, sit, and I thought it was a very helpful conversation around this idea of freedom or flexibility within a framework. But if you think about it, the heart of our legislation, is really around this this capacity to manage risk. So I'm really interested, what do you think that we're learning out of COVID-19 
uh, and you did sort of talk about few and simple rules, but is there any other observations uh, that you would see that would help in terms of enabling more effective management of risk, which in, in essence is then meeting our obligations under the Workplace Health and Safety Act and regulations? Well, well I mean, one of the things that, that I think we, we discussed in, um, in that wonderful discussion, Sid, Rosa and I, uh, was uh, the fact that when you bring people into uh, the, your confidence, um, when you explain to them the why you are doing something, uh, you invariably end up with better results. Uh, and I think we've lost that art. I think our legislation uh, and the guidance around the legislation uh, has, um, ha has leaned too much towards uh, the compliance aspects uh, and not enough of it is um, explaining the why. Um, and, uh, and so I'd, I would love to see, and this is not a question of legislation as such, but rather uh, the role of codes of practice uh, in actually engaging in the storytelling, the folklore, the reasons why we have um, confined space uh, rules. I was in a, in, a, in a different webinar. And I'll share this with you, Mark. And someone said, you know, uh, piggybacked off one of my comments in relation to simplification and bureaucracy. Uh, and we were talking about, and they said, well, yeah, no, um, you know, if, for example, uh, with our confined spaces, you know, there is a standby person and we think that's completely useless. And I said, whoa, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on. You understand why you have this standby, per standby person. Uh, and, and, and these are all the, the situations uh, that could go wrong in, um, uh, in that context. I think the part of the problem is people take a, a broad message like we need to simplify uh, or we need to rationalize uh, the, the rules. And they think that means all rules are bad. And if we just remove all rules, then we'll be all uh, better off. That's not the case. Uh, the, the idea is that we need to actually um, uh, simplify, declutter, remove the rules that don't have that, that kind of value. Uh, and, you know, we used to, used to be good at doing uh, regulatory impact assessments uh, that, that really kind of look at whether a rule is really, a legal uh, rule is really necessary, whether it adds sufficient value uh, considering its compliance costs and, and the burden that it imposes. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting that, that we don't do that anymore. We still do that. But I think it's, it's it, the, the art form of that and the scrutiny around that has not become as robust as it once uh, was. And we need to be constantly uh, just testing whether or not what we have here is something that is, um, uh, that, 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 that is required. And if it is required, let's go about explaining the why it is required. So people are brought into um, um, you know, the, the confidence of the regulators um, who, uh, who can um, kind of illustrate uh, that many of those rules that in, in that category, the ones that are really required, that ones that have value that are risk-based, uh, have been paved and drafted with the blood of many workers who have died um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, teaching us the, 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 the lessons we've now learned and enshrined in, in rules. And, and I, uh, nowhere has that insight been imparted to me uh, then in, in this wonderful project that I got involved in in Australia uh, with, with uh, the mining regulators, who are some of the best in the world, um, I must say, and I am biased, but the Australian mining regulators are some of the best in the world. Um, and when we sat in the room and tried to do the exercise of rationalising laws um, and harmonising them between uh, different jurisdictions as part of a project called the National Mine, uh, Mine Safety Framework, um, and, you know, you would sit down um, and you would look at a regulation by regulation, uh, and, and someone would say, okay, the reason we have this, and they would then list you all the disasters that have led to the conclusion that we need to provide this guidance, right? And then no one can argue with it. No one, no one, no one can, once you explain why we have put this, uh, this particular uh, regulatory guidance, this particular, uh, and, and it's more than guidance, this compliance burden on people, then no one can complain about it. No one, no one would argue with it. And it's that art of explaining the why, right? Um, and so when you say to people, uh, you know, in the context of COVID, um, you know, what we want you to do is uh, not come into contact with, with that uh, too close with people for, for the, for, for, because we don't want you to contract COVID, 
people understand that. They get it. They get the consequences of it. And they, then they get the context in which you are trying to uh, impose those, um, uh, those requirements. And they are more likely then to comply with it and to embrace uh, the, the requirements. I hope that helps, Mark. Yeah, look, I think it's really helpful. Rosa, you want to uh, build on that, please? I want. I would like to ask Michael a question uh, because uh, one of the challenges is how we can communicate with people in a way where they feel satisfied. Because we could put out a sixty-page memo, right, yeah. uh, that has all the information that you need on it, and, and mm. that I don't think that would have the effect that you're talking about. How no. how have yeah. seen that done successfully? Well, well, let's let's use the COVID example because that's what he, we're here talking about, Riza. Okay. And yeah. I, I'm sure I'm sure you found this as useful as I did. Um, uh, you know, when people started to shift the language towards guys, uh, we need to flatten the curve. People start to get it. People start to understand. Okay, and and you explain to them. I mean, it's quite a it's quite a confronting message, and, and I'm not sure people fully understand what uh, governments were saying to us. They, they were saying to us, we're going to prolong this crisis, right? Over time, not we're not actually. Um, it's even attempting to ameliorate uh, as such the, 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 the number of people infected. We're just trying to make sure that we have the hospital beds uh, and, and, and the, the nursing staff uh, and the ventilators to actually accommodate the people who are going to be infected. Because if we do it in, a, in the peak in which this curve is, is presenting itself, um, people who are in need are not going to be able to get the help that they need uh, when they need it. And in fact, um, you know, the corollary of that is other people who have other health conditions will also not get the beds and, so, and, and, and the support that they need and will have a major crisis. Um, over time, the language started to shift about shifting the curve, as in shifting the shape of the curve, as in having less people infected. But the initial focus was really, I mean, you know, when you explain it to people, it's basically, um, you know, guys, we just we, we, we have a health system that can't cope with you if all of you get sick at the same time. Um, so work with us in relation to that. And that visual, and that's become the rallying cry across the world, flatten the curve, flatten the curve. My curve is better than yours. Um, you know, that competitive spirit. Oh, well, look, you know, look, look, at, look at this country. It's got a huge peak. Look at this country. It's done a better job because its curve is, is, um, uh, is flatter. Uh, and then... Then you get into kind of other debates about, um, you know, elimination of the virus and, and, and whether, whether that is, that is uh, something you should aspire to do um, or, or not. You can have a healthy debate about that. And then you can start to have the conversation that we're having at the moment in some jurisdictions around the trade-off, right? If you think about it, Rosa, and, and I'm sure you agree with this, it, the sophistication of the conversation that we're having at the moment it's quite confronting. We are really saying uh, in some jurisdictions we have sufficiently dealt with this COVID-19 issue, but the trade-off of doing so is so great in other areas like mental health, like, like, like economic, the economic impact and the social economic impact and, and, and the, the, the imbalance, the, the, the imbalanced way in which that burden um, falls mm -hmm. On, um, on vulnerable parts of, of the community, particularly in some parts of the world where, where literally, you know, no job, no food, you can't feed your family, you can't, you can't, you can't support your loved ones. Um, you, the, 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 social, the social system is, is, is not there to, uh, to come to your aid. Uh, and so there's a trade-off in public policy that happens all the time. And really, for the first time, you know, leaders and the, and, 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 and the greatest leaders in this context have been the ones more, more, most forth, forthcoming, have stared down um, the, 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 the barrel of, um, of the cameras and said to their people, this is the trade-off that we're doing. It's worth it in those circumstances. Now we need to shift our focus to something else. And those who have done exceptionally well have communicated that message with simplicity, with clarity. Um, and, and even though in some cases, as you have pointed out in the debate earlier, uh, it's been confronting because for some essential um, essential uh, services uh, workers, we say, well, actually, everyone else social distance, but you can't. You, you've still got to turn up to work because we need you to turn up to work. Uh, but, but you're able to have that nuanced discussion with people with that clarity. So for me, um, it, it's explaining the why, explaining it with simplicity, explaining it visually, 
um, you know, get into to the nub of, of the issue. It's not through reports, uh, but it's the sharing of data. It's sharing of modeling and results of modeling uh, and, and explaining those things uh, in the, in, uh, you know, in a, in a, in a transparent way. Uh, not hiding behind volume of, of, um, of material, but actually looking for crisp communication strategies uh, that, that in one image, in one graph, can communicate those, those, those complex messages. Michael, I think it's, uh, yeah, I was just going to say, I think it's a great point. I'm just aware of time, and uh, we've got another five to eight minutes. And so I thought I might come back to you first, Rod, and then I'm going to look uh, around the screen and see who might just sort of give me a signal who would like to ask either Rosa or Michael a question, and I'll explain what we'll do in a moment uh, to make that so it's not completely chaotic. Uh, so to you, Rod, do you have another question? Yeah, thanks, Mark. It might be worth throwing to Kurt. I think he had a, a good question in the chat. If you want to take yourself off mute, Kurt. Right. Thank you, Kurt. I think I'm off mute. Yep, you're both off mute. We're just seeing if Kurt is still online. Oh, Kurt. Yeah, Kurt Warren, if you're still online, maybe Kurt has had to leave. Now, there he is. Over to you, Kurt. Come on, Kurt. Don't, uh, don't, don't make it too hard, mate. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we had to struggle for 15 minutes to get our mute off. <laughs> uh, I think uh, Kurt, he, he's making a profound point that uh, we all should value. There he you might go, come back. Kurt, you're off. Try again, Kurt. Sadly, not Kurt. Um, uh, I, what I'm, I'm going to do, I'm Rod, what, just, was the, uh, what was the uh, good question that you. Uh, you spotted yeah. that Kurt had asked. Yeah, put so, that to the um, panel. So Kurt said that he, he was picking up on Rosa's point that we are supervised by our social frameworks, not our regulators, and he was mm. interested, how can we learn more about these frameworks and harness their influence? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, um, that's a large part of my book uh, that, that I just published, which has to do with that we're not paying enough um, attention to the social systems in the organization. We've been waylaid by all of the technical and technological issues. Uh, and, uh, but it's really in the end, when the, when the regulator's gone, when the supervisor's gone, when the manager's gone, who is it that's really um, regulating people's behavior? And it's our peer group. And it's not just with their presence, because uh, the other interesting thing is that we carry these voices in our head that tell us, oh, you better not do it that way, you know, or, hey, you don't need to follow this, this procedure, you don't need it. Uh, so you can learn more about that um, uh, by reading my book, <laughs> but, also, <laughs> but also by looking, uh, looking up on the internet, um, you know, the importance of social um, systems and social fields and the influence that they have on, on human behavior. And it's so simple, which is treat, people with respect, uh, listen, implement their ideas. I mean, it's it's not difficult to do it. Well, I shouldn't say that because we, we don't do it all of the time. It's simple, but difficult to do. Excellent. Thanks, Rosa. Is there an, one other question, Rod, that you've got there? Otherwise, I'm going to go to the board and see who'd like to ask a question. Before, 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 before you do, I'll just, I'll just add, Rosa, that... Um, uh, you see from how insightful Kurt's, Kurt's question is why I have to work so hard and stress if my clients are this smart in their questions. It's, uh, it's hard work. You know, you've got, you've got to bring your, your, your A game every day, right? <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. Uh, this, 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 Rose, this while Rod's getting the uh, question, in all seriousness, um, we, we, we are great fans of your work. And uh, one of the things that we've done as Art of Work and AIHS is, is to make sure we create an open platform of sharing ideas. Uh, what is the, the latest name of your book? So I know people will be scrambling, searching on Google. What is the latest name so we make sure that they arrive at the right spot, Rosa? Oh, it's the, um, the Relationship Factor in Safety Leadership. Yep, it's a great read. I've heard a number of people um, who've read the book, Rosa, and they have uh, come back with glowing uh, feedback of how helpful it's been and the practical insights. So, um, yeah, um, and uh, we'll just add AIHS and, uh, 
and uh, Art of Work received no commission for this infomercial. Yes. But um, I'll be making, you'll be getting my contributions. In the yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Rosa. Uh, and if Sydney was here, he'd also be promoting another book. But what I'm going to do, I'm just going to look to, I can see on the screen here uh, well over 50 plus people. So what I'm going to do is uh, you can either wave at me, you can go off mute, and I'm going to call your name, and we've got time for two last questions uh, for Michael and Rosa, who I might add have been super generous. They've given their time not only in terms of today's webinar, uh, but then have hung back and uh, joined. And I know Sydney, as Kelvin has pointed out, would be very disappointed that he was unable uh, to join this conversation because I think it's in this festival of dangerous ideas that simplicity and a way forward uh, can be charted, both for you as individuals and for our organisations. But I can see that Leeton has come off um, mute, so I'm going to go to Leeton first. I'm going to come to you then, Rachel, uh, next. So, Leeton, do you want to uh, ask a question or make a comment, please? I can see. Uh, oh, you got muted, Mark. There you go. Okay, I uh, Leighton, uh, I think we need to try again. Sadly, not. Okay, I'm going to come to you, Rachel, and uh, see if you uh, can ask the question, please. Can you hear me? Okay. You can indeed. Excellent, thanks. Mine's very specific. Um, I just really wanted to ask about this, the COVID situation, whether or not anything's changed in relation to trainees and students uh, going into workplaces to have um, learning experiences. And particularly, I'm thinking about aged care, health service settings, and that, that is the area that I work in, but it can be broader than that. Because I, I was thinking that really nothing's changed from usual it's just that COVID shone a spotlight on the responsibility of various services when we have others coming into them that are not usually there. So I just wondered if you could say anything about that that might provide some you know, assistance in how to deal with that situation moving forward. Does that make sense? Did, did you understand my question? I did. Uh, Rosa, do you want to okay. start and I can add um, right. to, to that? Well, I, I think... think if you're asking about the legalities, uh, Michael would be far better yeah. than I. Um, if that was that your question, Rachel, the legality? I'm mainly asking about the legalities, oh, but sure. I think yep. that these things are broader than the legalities, as, yep. as your previous yeah, webinar because, also I mean, pointed to. I know they've closed the universities here in the states, and they're they're going to go everything going online. We don't want to expose students to group meetings until. Uh, the uh, rate has, you know, gone down and get enough testing going. At this point, we don't. And we have to remember that the Spanish flu came back three times. And that's mm -hmm. how millions of people died, okay? So we can't rush into things because we think, uh, you know, we're anxious to do them, <laughs> do them widely. So, Michael, what are, what are some of the... Uh, Guideline. No, no. I think I think I think I think that's right, and it's a, it's it's a good way of uh, positioning the discussion. So one of the things you, you you've got to remember is that um, people are encouraged to uh, look at eliminating things that are um, not necessary, uh, and sadly, it will come it, that that will be uh, one of the categories that people will look very closely at. Whether in in fact uh, the training and vocational training aspect uh, is really uh, essential work at this uh, at this point in time. Uh, and uh, and and therefore, if you can remove people from that risk, then um, then that would be uh, the reasonably practicable thing um, to do. Now, that's not a great um, uh, long-term social outcome um, uh, or public policy outcome. Um, and one of the things that um, uh, this uh, crisis has shown the light on is the fact that, uh, in fact, um, we perhaps should have a lot more nurses. We should have a lot more doctors. We should have a lot more um, aged care. Um, uh, professionals um, supporting um, our um, uh, our um, uh, uh, those services, uh, but but I think an, an inevitable part of the risk assessment process will be uh, whether in fact training at this moment in time 
uh, is really in that essential category or whether in fact uh, you are by bringing those individuals uh, into an aged care facility, for example, um, uh, or into a workplace, you're not only exposing them, but exposing others um, to uh, uh, potential additional risk. Great. Thanks, Michael. We've got time for one Thank last you. question. So, um, and, and I appreciate that's a difficult question, Rachel. It's a balancing of the risk. Um, and uh, it also, you know, with risk is, is both opportunity and loss of opportunity. Um, so can I see if there's one more person who waves, who goes off mute, and uh, you'll, you'll be the final person to ask a question just before I thank people for joining uh, today's extended Q&A. Yeah, thank you, Julius. Um, um, please take yourself off mute and uh, ask your question. Uh, you're still on mute there. If you could just unmute. Hello. Yep, Hello. you are good. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm actually not Julius. That is my son uh, who was on the computer before me. And uh, <laughs> I was, I was, I was trying to figure that out, but I thought, you know what, you should just go with first instinct and go <laughs> with the name on true. the screen. No, no. For those that I haven't met, my name is Susan Fleming and I run uh, ACT Australia, which is industrial theatre uh, training in safety. And we take stories incidents and turn them into thanks Carolyn uh, and we take stories and turn them into learning workshops lessons learned or problem solving and I'm really interested to hear from Rosa one thing that's been striking me during this conversation was we're very much focused on supporting uh, safety leaders and I'm wondering what Rosa your advice would be about those leaders managing up in the social relationship context, what advice would you give them about encouraging their leaders and the leaders of organisations to look at this social context? Oh, all right. <laughs> That's a <laughs> question. It really is. Uh, and um, one of the things that I've observed uh, in working with young professionals who just graduated is that they always say, oh, they never taught me how to work with people, you know, they never taught me how to manage my boss, they never taught me how to manage upwards. And those of us who have experience know that that is, that those are key skills to have. Um, I would say that you have to, um, first, you have to be willing to assume a leadership stance yourself, which means you're taking self accountability, and you're willing to extend yourself to become a listener and find out what's important to the leader and try to help them achieve their goals. It would be the same thing as if you were managing downwards, really. You know, you talk with an employee, you find out uh, what they need, you support them, you help them, and now they're, now they're willing to follow you and they're willing to support you. And it's the same thing when you're working upwards. Um, listen and then uh, come up with... Uh, with, with potential solutions. And I would say, don't give up. Don't give up. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't work the first or second time, but it really is the only way that you're eventually going to become influential. Mm, mm. Yes, I think that's good advice to encourage safety leaders with. And I believe that, as we've talked about today, they are um, an at-risk community at the moment. Social le uh, safety leadership is really meat in the sandwich, as we've discussed, but we don't need to go there again. Thank you for your comprehensive answer. Thanks, Rosa. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're welcome. A great session, by the way. Fantastic. Glad you enjoyed it. Thank you for attending. Okay, everyone. Look, um, Mark's just dropped off the call. Um, so I think we're going to wrap it up there, but I'd really just like to thank Michael and Rosa for spending the time to answer our questions and also like to thank AIHS for um, co-hosting this with Art of Work. So thanks very much and we'll end the call there.